possibly the most eagerly awaited phone ever after the original Apple iPhone and arguably the Nokia N95 all those years ago, the Google Nexus One has a lot to live up to. Its biggest strength lies in what it runs. Android, a modern design from the ground up mobile OS for the modern age, is barely a couple of years old and is sprightly at every turn and refreshingly free of legacy code or general baggage. Android is being updated at a ferocious pace and the Nexus One is the most powerful, most flexible testbed for it. HTC may add their own tuppence worth to Android in the Hero and Motorola their own in the Droid Stroke Milestone, but it's here in the Nexus One and you get the full unabridged, untampered Android experience with full over-the-air immediate updates from Google every time the OS gets updated and enough RAM and processor power to see you through a couple of years of these updates making the Nexus One a super testbed for geeks all around the world. This, at least, is one phone that's going to grow with you. But back to the phone itself, it's the same width as the Apple iPhone, slightly taller and a millimetre or so thinner, but it feels smaller than it actually is, thanks to every corner being rounded and chamfered. In fact, it's so curvy that it's easy to drop, it just oozes out of the hand, so keep a tight hold. Impressively, the screen is a large 3.7-inch capacitive AnOLED, giving the Nexus One a potentially stunning display and touch experience indoors. HTC, the makers, have done a super job here, though as you should be aware of a few caveats. Uh, capacitive screens, as I mentioned in the last show, can be a nuisance when you're picking a phone up, and they may not work happily if your finger is too dry or too wet. In addition, as I found out with the Nokia N86 and Samsung i 910 HD, and also mentioned in the last show, OLED screens are unable to cope with direct sunlight. If you live somewhere sunny, you might want to think about the Apple iPhone 3GS after all. Notable from looking around the Nexus One are a wraparound metal frame here, a 3.5mm audio out jack, power sleep buttons, volume buttons, plus a micro USB jack on the bottom for charging and data. No camera button though, sadly, as you'll see later. Uh, the front buttons are actually just an extension of the capacitive touchscreen and not particularly well aligned. You have to hit on the high side of each icon for any effect. HTC should have printed the icons right over the touchscreen sweet spot and there wouldn't have been a problem. There's also a multi-LED trackball, useful for notifications and for nudging the cursor in text fields. Remember that capacitive touchscreens and fingers don't make for accurate touch positioning. On the back is an HTC spec camera, again more of which later, along with a single LED flash and a tiny slot for a mono tinny speaker, rather unfortunately positioned so that if a, a cradling finger happens to be in the wrong place, you lose your sound. Very annoying when you're trying to watch a video or, or listen to a podcast while doing other things on your smartphone. Also on the back is a tiny microphone used to sample ambient noise and then subtract this from your voice calls, a system that works really well. Inside the unit is a 1400 milliamp hour battery that just about copes with keeping the Nexus One on the rails in the face of being online all the time and much intensive use. You'll definitely need to charge it each night though and if you just can't put the thing down during the day then you'll need to top it up halfway through or get a second battery. Laws of physics and all that. Start up the Nexus One and you're in a Google-dominated world of pleasure. From live wallpapers, uh, check out this rippling pond for example, to complete integration of your Facebook contacts into your Google contacts, to the best mobile Gmail client, to Google Maps, Google Talk, Google's YouTube client, and well, you get the idea. If you've got a free Google account and use it heavily, choosing Android as your mobile OS and the Nexus One as your device is almost a no-brainer. There are still some surprising omissions though. There are no Office file viewers or even PDF viewing out of the box. You'd have thought some kind of Google Documents client would have been here. One for later in 2010 perhaps. Thankfully, the built-in Android market fills in most gaps. Adding in, for example, the free DataViz Office file viewers and optionally editors, also missing out of the box are a file manager and a podcatcher, a task manager. Again, all quick and easy free downloads in the Android market, thankfully. Searching the market is easy with thousands of apps to choose from. Downloading and installing takes only seconds and you're notified of updates to anything you've previously grabbed, a system I really like. Commercial apps are best paid for using Google Checkout. Think of it as a cross between PayPal and your credit card. Disappointingly, there's limited space for applications. There are less than 200 megabytes. Though apparently Google are working on a way to remove this limitation by opening up the memory card as well. So for example, big games might be possible. 
With no physical keyboard, you're reliant here on a virtual QWERTY keyboard, and this works in all applications in both portrait and landscape mode. There are writing aids to autocorrect miss keys, and there's a degree of multi-touch on the capacitive screen, so you don't have to lift each thumb before touching the screen for the next letter. However, the handling of capacitive touch a finger contact area and the abilities of the text correction aren't a patch on apples. I've heard of people using the iPhone to input text faster than the best physical keyboards. Uh, this is barely okay for short texts, but I wouldn't want to write anything longer on this. Maybe this too will improve as Google push out Nexus One updates. Google do tout voice recognition as an alternative, of course. There are microphone icons everywhere. From search boxes to general text entry forms, in theory you can use this to create emails and texts, but in practice I was only getting a recognition rate of about 75%, and the technology needs to get to a 99% before it's usable in real life. Let's see how it did. From search boxes to general text and people to see you, please describe any mountain text in practical. You get the idea. More examples. Steve signing off became David Still Sunny of. Badminton with Bob became Badminton Lime Gold. And potentially embarrassingly, meeting with Jane became mating with Jane. <laughs> Speaking with an American accent like this improved things slightly. I can't do accents, but this really shouldn't be necessary. Out of the box, the application loadout is fairly sparse, but then there's the Android market to rely on. Apart from the Google synced calendar and contacts, you get gallery for playing back MP3 and AAC music, uh, plus MP4, though sadly not WMV or DivX videos. Photos and videos that do work look stunning on the OLED screen, of course. Music is taken care of with a functional player, though no EQ settings or frills. And by a built-in music store run by Amazon with DRM-free track prices from as low as 30p. And so to the camera. I called it HDC spec earlier, meaning that the usual fairly low-grade components I used. Hey, I've been spoilt by the likes of Nokia's N95 and N86. The results are still quite okay for casual use. Even HTC has been improving this department. There's still disappointing handling of light extremes and, and there's poor white balance in cases. And with no shutter button, all you can do is point and tap hopefully on the shutter icon, focusing as automatic around a second later and the shot is then taken, during which time hopefully your subjects haven't moved. Videos are at 720 by 480 pixels and might be usable for a fun upload to YouTube but for the appalling quality of the recorded soundtrack. I'm guessing this is a codec issue and can be fixed by Google and not a microphone limitation per se. Mind you, with that OLED screen and its sunlight problems, you'll be unlikely to be doing too much photography or camcording on the Nexus One in the first place. If you do take photos or videos, you can share them easily to Picasa, of course, or Facebook, adding captions as needed. Gallery and indeed the desk clock both make use of the powerful one gigahertz processor it's the same as on the HTC HD2, by the way, with silky smooth zooming, panning and slideshows. Web browsing on the Nexus One is generally excellent. That processor again allied to the WVGA screen and the double tap to zoom in and out effect. There's no multi-touch zooming here, but maybe this too can be added in a firmware update. There's no flash support in the browser, but at least embedded YouTube objects get their video rerouted through to the YouTube client, which is a neat workaround. Never mind the gimmicks, I love the way Android on this device has been set up. A maximum of five home screens and a cornucopia of widgets, weather, music, search and Facebook, and shortcuts to apps or shortcuts mean that you'll be able to set up the Nexus One to show exactly the items that are important to you. And also that no two Nexus Ones will have home screens that look remotely the same. My only disappointment on this front is that the home screens are the only aspect of the Nexus One that doesn't, repeat, doesn't work in landscape mode annoyingly inconsistent. And as I try and use the last of the light before it snows here in the UK winter, final niggles include the auto brightness being set too low. Um, Google presumably want to save battery here, and also the way the backlight intensity uh, kind of changes as you move around, which is rather spooky. Rather like the, the MIMO 5 powered Nokia N900, the Android powered Nexus One isn't exactly a finished product, in the sense that it's still only 80% the smartphone it could be. I've simply said too many times in the last five minutes that such and such could be fixed in the future. Which is not to say it's not usable now. The Nexus One, as is, is still in the same ballpark as the other top phones in the world, the speed, 
the interface, the online integration, the Android market, they all impress. And you can't deny that the Nexus One is simply a beautiful piece of technology. And the use of unfettered, unabridged, there's the Google logo, <laughs> unaltered Android, a Google phone with the full Google experience means that with update after update over the year, this is one smartphone that's just going to get better. With improvements to the Nexus One and with the Nexus Two, rumoured, complete with QWERTY hardware, the Nexus story is far from told and I'll be revisiting it throughout 2010. Uh, sure, Blingo is a voice user interface for Symbian phones, so as you mentioned on the N97, uh, there's a uh, widget on the screen you can touch and speak anything you'd like to do. Speak a Facebook update, uh, an SMS, a web search. We translate the speech to text and then uh, go off and do whatever it was you wanted to do. Um, on the E72, we're hooked to the side button on uh, the convenience camera yeah. phone. Yeah, we do. Uh, so we run on uh, the uh, RIM BlackBerry devices. We run on uh, Apple iPhone as well as Windows Mobile and uh, later this quarter on Android. That's right, yeah, a premium function where typically social networking, web searching, dialing the phone uh, and things like that are free. People have to pay to speak text messages or speak emails. No, there is a connection with the server, so uh, when you speak to, to the device uh, using Blingo software, um, we take your audio, take it over an internet connection, our servers do the speech to text and return the words to the screen. That's really the only way to do what we do, which is true unconstrained speech recognition for a mobile phone. There's just not enough processing power and memory on the device to do it locally. Uh, so quite a bit, the, the key uh, accuracy improvements in our system come from the fact that we're an adaptive technology. So the first time a user speaks to uh, a Blingo service, we capture what's called a personal language model, a little bit of information about the acoustics of their voice, their pronunciations, and we store that. Every time that user uses their phone, in real time, in runtime, we're retrieving their personal language model and continuously adapting it and making it better. Right. That's right, and not just for you, but the more people that use it, the better it gets because there's also a network effect with this technology. So it does get better over time, and, and that's really the magic of what we do. Right. No, not at all. I mean, we would be talking milliseconds of difference of the time to recognize 20 seconds of audio versus 5 seconds of audio. Well, that's impressive. Okay. That's right. So what we're looking at uh, with some of our partners are in-car systems where there's a power source, right? Because yeah. the key limiter to, to the scenario use case you just described, and we were talking about this earlier, uh, is battery drain, yeah. right? If the yeah. phone's always listening, uh, that's a big drain on the battery. But in-car where you can be connected to power, yeah. uh, it's a very realistic scenario. Uh, absolutely, and as a matter of fact, it's on our roadmap for this year, so this year you'll see uh, the ability with Blingo to be able to do exactly as you say, uh, listen to an incoming email or text message, and then just speak the word reply, and dictate your reply, and then have it read back to you, in other words, read back what I said so I know it got it right, and then just speak the word sent. Yeah. Fundamentally, a voice is a pretty self-evident and necessary user interface for mobile devices. You know, as an industry, we ship a billion devices a year now. All of them, from the high-end touchscreen to the uh, very small, low-end uh, feature phones, have 3G connections, and they're all capable of running great wireless internet services. Yeah. But they're all still fundamentally constrained by a user interface. Yeah. So just as keyboards are a good user interface and touchscreens are, we think voice is the next one. That's exactly right. We, we start out with recognizing a number of things. So for example, um, as Ashley knows, when we launched our first betas here um, uh, in the UK, we had it configured that if you said call Ashley, phone Ashley, or dial Ashley, that would take the action of, of dialing Ashley's number out of my phone. What our scientists heard or saw statistically in the beta was a lot of people saying a new word that we hadn't heard before, which was ring. Yeah. So ring Ashley. So that's very easy from the server side to say when someone speaks the word ring, take the action of pulling them out of the phone book and dialing the phone. So we can add uh, additional recognition and even additional uh, applications from the server side.